Welcome Team Encore members. We've got our famous golf writer, Ron Montesano here today. Ron, how are you? I'm well, Steve. How are you today? Doing well. Thanks for, for being on our little show here. And we're excited to interview you. I think um, it's one of those where, where the tables have turned, right? Normally you're doing the interviewing and, and writing, and, and now we get to kind of turn the microphone over to you and, and hear, hear your story. And for, for our readers, Ron is a writer for Encore, but before that he has been writing for Golf WRX, buffalogolfer.com, and also a teacher. Spanish and a golf coach. So, you know, we probably should have started with what you don't do. Um, the <laughs> list would have been shorter. But, um, you know, with, with that little intro, you know, I was, I was kind of curious first how you got into golf writing. Thank you for all that. I really <laughs> like how I sound. Uh, I'll give you two short stories. Uh, when I was uh, a freshman at Wake Forest University back in the fall of 1983, I tried out for the golf team, was cut, and then signed on to write for the Old Golden Black, which was the school student newspaper. And the golf coach at the time was very gracious and generous with his time. And so I had unfettered access to him and the guys on the team. And uh, so that was kind of what really uh, lit the match. And then when I returned to Buffalo and knew I was gonna be here full time, I actually started Buffalo Golfer in 1999. It was called Buff Golf back then, and it was a, an eight and a half by 11 sort of fold over newsletter, a little leaflet that we would pass out at area courses. And then a student of mine uh, showed me how he had made a website in 2000, and I looked at it and I said, so anybody anywhere in the world can access this? He said, yep, and I said, okay, I'm hooked. And, and from there, it just got bigger. Well, you kind of you kind of saw the writing on the wall, no pun intended, with the with the internet and kind of the shift from from uh, you know print newspapers to uh, digital. So that that's uh, very very smart of you um, in those early days. And um, why don't you tell folks a little bit about Buffalo Golfer and and maybe what you do for Golf WRX as well. Buffalo Golfer has always been my pet project. Uh, it's, I just always wanted to have uh, an outlet for golf uh, stories, golf interviews, and also bringing uh, the news from the wide world back to Western New York and say, hey, this is what's happening out there. I can't guarantee that people are looking at other sites, but I know that if I can organize certain things on Buffalo Golfer and if I can stop into area clubs and courses and do a bit of a, of a rundown of what's happening there, I think people appreciate it. it. It kind of validates what we're doing in golf here. And I love golf in Western New York. So for me, it's, it's a labor of love. Um, actually, the Orchard Park High School coach, Nate Leary, sent me the link to Golf WRX probably 10 years ago. And he said, you know, you should be writing for them. They have a call out right now for writers. So I, I answered it and I had to do a sort of a test article and they liked what they saw. And so uh, I've been writing for them ever since in a variety of capacities. So I have Nate Leary to thank for that. And every time my team loses to his in our annual challenge match, I at least get to thank him for that before I uh, get angry at him. <laughs> so I noticed on, on Buffalo Golfer, you've got a tremendous amount of uh, resources there about local courses. Um, I imagine for, for people maybe visiting the region, um, you know, it's a great place to um, find some local courses and um, kind of get excited about the area and what it has to offer in golf. Um, and I know for Encore, you've done a lot on travel writing. And with everything going on in the world today, I think, uh, you know, people are, are stuck at home in a lot of cases. Um, and maybe they're daydreaming about upcoming golf trips uh, when, you know, when the, the virus passes. Um, so maybe just, just a little segue. Um, hmm. You've done a tremendous amount of golf travel writing. Um, any, any trips that should, should be on our, our mind as, as golfers who, who love to play and, and travel? 
Um, boy, for me, it's always about the people I'm with. I have a, a group that I really like to travel with. And uh, I've had really good fortune. I've been to Bandon Dunes. I've been to Pinehurst. I've been to Myrtle Beach. I've been to Northern Michigan. And those are all areas where um, I guess a golf junket is already set for you if you want it. And uh, they're all different from each other and they're all unique and they're all spectacular. And for me, uh, it's worth saving the money and saying, you know what, I'm going to have an experience uh, that I will not forget. And it's going to be with, uh, with friends that I know will appreciate it. And at the same time, I've also created my own sort of off the cuff uh, trips. I went to Cape Cod one time and just went from the, the, the beginning of the Cape all the way out to Provincetown and then back and discovered some incredible courses there along the way, but nothing was connected. Um, I just, I'm a big fan of the fellow who from East Aurora, who is turning the golf world upside down, Mike Kaiser. Yep, he yep. just builds wonderful resorts. He has Bandon Dunes. He has Sand Valley in the middle of Wisconsin. He has Cabot up in uh, Cape Breton Island in the Canadian Maritime Islands. And he's actually working on a new one down in the Caribbean. And what he does is he brings, uh, I guess he brings tourism to areas that are somewhat blighted and are struggling a little bit economically. And he says, listen, I'm not here to take advantage of you. You have spectacular golfing grounds. And I uh, think that by developing this tourism industry, it will be beneficial for you as well. And he, he's just sincere like that. So I love all of his properties, but if you're with the right people, uh, you can't go wrong. Now, um, now um... Mr. Kaiser told me he was he was banning you from his courses because you were you were breaking too many course records out there at uh, Abandoned Dunes, right? And uh, so <laughs> you're kind. He's, uh, um, but he's, he's you no, know, that would be the, the nail in my coffin if I was banned from his courses <laughs> for so many reasons. Um, yeah, yeah, I think Abandoned Dunes is definitely um, definitely on my list and um, Porter Cup Cabot, Club. Yep. Cabot Links and you had a good old Porter Cup, Niagara Falls. <laughs> um, so, so that that kind of brings me back a little to so Mike is tied in with Nichols, mm -hmm. and and you're a teacher there and a golf coach. So, can you maybe give us a little bit of background on on your teaching and coaching? Absolutely. Um, I, I teach Spanish at the school. And uh, I've been very fortunate to teach a number of different uh, levels of Spanish. And one of the neat things that we have there are exchanges that we do every year. In fact, as you and I are speaking right now, I'm supposed to be in Spain with an exchange group, but we know the situation in the world. And so fortunately, we, we got on the cancellation train early and we told the kids, listen, we think this is going to get bigger than it is. And we don't want to do it, but we know that we have to do it. And unfortunately, uh, time proved it to be the proper uh, decision. I've also been able to go to Costa Rica with our exchange program. So it's one of the things that I love most about the teaching uh, side of what I do. And then when it comes to coaching, I'm able to coach our girls varsity in the springtime and I coach our boys varsity in the fall. And actually, I'm going to jump on a Zoom meeting tomorrow with my assistant coach and our three captains of the girls team to just wrap our heads around where we are and make sure that they communicate to the other girls on the team that whether we play 100 holes of golf this spring or we don't play another hole of golf this spring, that we're still a team and that that team going forward will be together and, uh, and we will get past this. Um, on the other hand, you've got the boys season starting basically in late August. And what didn't seem like it would extend that far. Now we're looking at saying, we know how the spring is looking for education, but can we even project a normal reopening of all of our schools in the fall? And 
I also happen to run the, uh, the Monsignor Martin Boys Golf League. So I, uh, I have to think about it not only from my coaching perspective, but also from the coaching perspectives of all the other coaches, the other nine coaches in the league. And we have to get together and say, let's be ready for this. Let's anticipate what might happen. So rather than having a whole bunch of head-to-head -head matches, maybe let's get a sense of what a plan B could be, which is maybe five uh, tournaments where we all get together and we, we change the paradigm of how we run a league. But what it means is we will at least run a league and be able to have a champion. Um, so we have to be ready for anything. And, uh, and before last month, I don't think any of us really thought that that would be a reality in this lifetime, but here we are. So for our listeners out there who, who maybe are curious, how, um, as a coach, how are you, you know, and, and a, a teacher, how are you managing uh, that relationship with your students and, and players? And how are the students and players dealing with, with these kind of uncertain times? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, people think that when kids, teenagers say, ah, I hate school, I don't want to be here that they're actually 100% sincere. They're about 2% sincere. They treasure that time with each other. They treasure the opportunity to drive their teachers crazy from time to time. They treasure the opportunity to hang out with each other, to enjoy the lunch, to complain about the lunch, to do all those things that we remember from being younger. And things haven't changed, even though we have technology, even though we have who knows what that's different from our uh, years of growing up. Human interaction hasn't changed. And so what we try to do is we try to bring the kids together. We tell them, listen, talk to each other, do a video chat with each other. It doesn't have to be all TikTok. It doesn't have to be all Snapchat. Just really reconnect with each other and know that you're there for each other. And don't be uh, shy about sharing your hopes and your fears with each other because that's what makes friendship. You know, we think back to our friends from when we are in our uh, single digits, when we were in our teen years, and we realize, my God, those are the people that I can go back to right away. And it's like nothing has changed. And we're kids again. Yep. And, and maybe, maybe for our golfers out there, any advice in terms of how to keep the game um, in shape? I know um, one of our ambassadors, John Guyberger, who's also a coach out in California, um, talked about visualization and how this this idea that you could play around the golf in your head. And, um, you know, golf, he made the point that golf is 90% mental. So mm -hmm. are, are there some things that, that you could um, provide our audience with um, to help them in, in these times? I think so. I 100% I agree with Mr. Guyberger. Um, I think working on the core is huge. Um, about 10 days ago, I actually threw my back out. I hate admitting that I'm getting old. So I've been working to get my back back in shape. And so <laughs> I'm recognizing, okay, I wasn't doing enough for my hamstrings. I wasn't doing enough stretching. I wa certainly wasn't doing enough core work. So I'm very gently easing back into things. And I would tell people, you know, get in touch with your, your medical people, get in touch with your trainers and say, what can I do to maybe work on my core, whether it's planks, whether it's any number of other exercises and, and just gently little by little, you don't have to take the world by storm, uh, just little by little get stronger and, and you'll be in, in terrific shape. Um, I think the most slippery slope is, who has access to golf courses and who doesn't. I know that I believe Ohio and New York both have allowed very restricted access to golf courses. And on buffalogolfer.com's Twitter account, we actually have a list pinned to the top of all the courses that are open, the public courses and all the ones that aren't open. And we never stop telling people, listen, if you don't abide by the restrictions, then you're becoming a threat and you're becoming a threat that's going to expand, uh, you know, 
proportionally. And, and that's, that's not a good thing. That's not, it's a very selfish thing to do. Um, so if people are able to get out to golf courses in their area, keep your distance. And again, it's not about getting a score. It's about playing some holes. It's about walking like you would in a park or something like that. So yep. again, without promoting it, I'm saying if people are able to make that choice, a personal choice, uh, be 125% conscious of what's around you and keep it safe. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. Um, you know, on, on the core front, um, I, I, my, myself, I just ordered a yoga mat, <laughs> so, um, came to, you know, face reality and, and realize that the gyms and, and everything are going to be closed, uh, for yeah. some time. So, um, you know, and in terms, in terms of getting out on the course, um, I a hundred percent agree. You gotta, you gotta stay, stay tuned with your local, um, restrictions and news and just follow the advice. Um, and certainly, you know, if you're, if you're out there, you know, just keep your distance. Right. And just, um, one, one of the writers for, I believe it was golf channel went out and interviewed people in, was in California, um, before maybe they closed down officially. And what he noticed was that the golfers just seemed to appreciate the game more. And, and like you said, it was, it was less about the score and it was just more, um, wow, this is, you know, being out in fresh air, um, and, and this opportunity to play. Um, so I think when things return to normal, I, I think we'll have a, a new appreciation for, um, this game that we all love. And, um, I, I'm sure there'll be, be many more, um, you know, consequences um, that, that are probably hard to see right now, but um, all right. So let's jump to a few questions here for you. What, what would you say is your favorite golf course um, anywhere in the U S or around the world? Um, it, it can be anywhere, but for me, um, it's the old course at St. Andrews. And the reason is, I know, right, I'm jumping right to the top. Uh, it teaches you there. I played it once. And what it did was it taught me that golf is meant to be played both along the ground and in the air. And it also teaches you that someone, whether it's your caddy, whether it's the starter, whether it's someone who's hanging out behind the 18th green, someone always knows more than you do. Um, and last but not least, it teaches you that first impressions simply scrape the surface and that what you see is not necessarily what you get. And if people really want to um, get a sense of that, I would tell you right now, go online and purchase the books Golf in the Kingdom and the Kingdom of Shiva's Irons, both written by Michael Murphy. They are fantastic books that will transport you instantly to to scotland and you will really feel like you're uh immersed in everything i just talked about and more well you certainly certainly got me excited for a trip across the pond I, i've never played golf um you know over in europe and um a, a reminder to our listeners out there if you've got questions for ron uh, please leave them in the comments and we will answer them right away um, you, you mentioned something about um, people knowing more about the game for you, uh, excuse me, than, than you. And I, I've often heard the caddies are just an incredible wealth of knowledge over there. Can you maybe speak to, for, for some of us who haven't had a chance to play um, these, these iconic courses over in Scotland and Ireland, what, what it's like um, with, with the caddies and that, that experience? I think it's important to understand that for many of them, it's their livelihood. It's what they do. And so they're doing a number of loops a day. Um, and they know these courses in a way that you cannot imagine when your ball takes off going askew, whether it's left or right or who knows where. They take it as a source of personal pride and they're honoring their ancestors 
by finding that golf ball. And hmm. it's, it's, it's funny. You'll see if, for example, my caddy is unable to find my shot, the caddy that's with somebody else will find a way almost wordlessly to indicate where it is to save face. And it just, it blew my mind when I saw it, when I was at the old course and I was broke beyond words. All I could do was afford the green fee. So I didn't have a caddy when I was there, but two of the people in my group did. And I just listened and listened and listened. And uh, I made a ridiculous par on the road hole there. And the two caddies just looked at me and in that beautiful Scottish uh, brogue, that accent, they said, laddie, that's one that you'll, uh, you'll take home with you and keep forever. And I just about melted right there. <laughs> There's something they transcend yeah. golf. They really do. Memories for a lifetime. It was. So favorite golf club. As in the one that I swing, not the one that yeah, I would. Uh... <laughs> correct. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Right now it's, um, it's actually this Callaway hybrid that I have. It's a three hybrid. And for whatever reason, I have 100% confidence anytime I hit it, but I am going to put this out there for all the listeners. I have not had a trustworthy three wood or three metal since I was about 14 years old. So if you have any suggestions, I mean, I haven't been able to hit par fives in two forever because I don't have a club that I can gun at the green. So if you have a suggestion for a three metal, God, I'm all ears. All right. Hopefully our listeners will give you some good feedback there. Mm -hmm. Your best score. Best score. I thought about this one. It would have to be a 70 that I shot many years ago at Audubon golf course on Maple wow. road in a club championship. There was tournament pressure and it actually was the only time I went under par uh, in my life. Reason is I gave up tournament golf at age 26 for dad duties. So I've never <laughs> looked back. I've always appreciated the I had to be a father. So that score will have to do. It's a great round. Thank you. And where, where is that course for, for listeners that, that may not be familiar? It's Audubon Golf Course. It's actually the town of Amherst Golf Course on Maple Road. Uh, it's near University of Buffalo. And uh, it's just east of Millersport uh, Highway going over Maple Road. What's the lowest score one of your, one of your golfers has shot? I've had some terrific golfers. I... Um, I had a young lady named Renee Sobolewski who played D1 golf at Vanderbilt. And I remember her shooting in the 70s in tournaments. Uh, Marin Chipola, who is completing her time down at University of Texas, also a D1 school. She also shot some mid to low 70s scores for us. And for the fellows, um, as a head coach, I think the best golfer that I had was uh, a young man named Gregory Civic, who went to Annapolis to the Naval Academy and was commissioned last spring. And I remember him as a freshman, he took dead aim at a back pin position on the sixth hole at the country club of Buffalo, which for those who know it, it's the volcano par three hole. And he stuck that six iron back in there Wow. And I looked at him, I said, don't ever do that to me again, because my heart can't take it. <laughs> so, of course, he waited until senior year, first match of the year against Canisius, uh, hit driver on the first hole at Cherry Hill, put it on the green, made the eagle putt. And I said to him, you just ruined the season for me. He said, why? <laughs> and I said, because every kid on the team is going to try to do that from <laughs> now on. And you can do it. They can't. So... <laughs> Just because they're great doesn't mean they make your life easy. Well, it must be, it must be really rewarding to, to have all of these former players, um, you know, as they advance in their careers mm -hmm. and um, to have, have been a, a part of that journey for them. Um, so I'm sure you've got many, many stories of, of students who've kept in touch over the years um, and, and I'm sure attribute a lot of their success to the coaching that they had from you. Well, for that, I'm grateful. They've been wonderful. They've taught me so much. Um, and I've, I've, I've been very fortunate to be able to coach both the girls and the, the fellows. So, so final question, 
what what's next for Ron Montesano? Um, we've got you've got a tremendous writing career, coaching, teaching. Um, what would you like to leave our viewers with in terms of how they can find you and, and stay on top of all these things you're doing? Um, if I can share a story, it's it's one that happened recently, but it's it's a really poignant one. And uh, people sometimes ask me, what's your funniest golf moment? And I'm thinking every shot I hit. But basically, <laughs> this one was really special. Um, last summer, I was with my, my three golfing buddies, and we were in northern Michigan. And we were at a golf course called Arcadia Bluffs uh, on our trip. And uh, I knew something that the other guys didn't know. And as we rounded the uphill curving eighth hole, which is his par four, a sound began and the guys were kind of guessing what it might be. And as we moved from the eighth green to the ninth tee on the bluff, just outside the clubhouse across the ditch, which was where the par three ninth sat. And this is about 5 PM, 6 PM. As the sun is starting to set, a piper was playing the bagpipes wow. and it was our final round of the trip. And the guys just looked at me and they said, almost as if they had prepared this, they said, you knew about this, didn't you? And I <laughs> nodded. And uh, we had the bro hug to end all bro hugs. And, uh, <laughs> and then, then I proceeded to lip out for ace on the night, which was crazy. So not every moment is perfect, but <laughs> that one was about as perfect as they can be. So I think what I'm looking forward to most is, um, is going wherever golf will allow me to go. Um, if it's right up the street to Beaver Island State Park, so be it. If it's to the next golf season, fantastic. If it's on another trip with my friends, amazing. But uh, I'm grateful to Encore and to Golf WRX for allowing me to write for them. And hopefully um, I'll do them all justice and a, a service because they've been wonderful to me. Well, thank you. We, we are grateful for you, Ron, and for sharing your wisdom and stories um, and, and phenomenal writing. Thank you for everything you've done today. And to our listeners, any questions, um, please leave them below. Ron is available, as, as are we. And thank you. Cheers. Cheers, my friend. Take yep. care. Cheers. Thanks, Ron.